Good morning and welcome to worship at Trinity Presbyterian Church. I am Tammy Boyles, the Director of Christian Education, Youth and Young Adults. Please let us know you are here by checking in on the appropriate sites. Next Sunday is Earth Day at Trinity, sponsored by our Creation Care Team. This is the day we appreciate God's gift of creation and consider how we might better care for our earthly home. We will have joyful worship both online and outdoors, and at the outdoor service, there will be an opportunity to learn more about pennies for panels and other projects of our Earth Care team. Our parish associate, Abby Mohop, will be preaching. On Tuesday, for the pastor's Bible study, Abby will be joined by Ted Hebert, an Old Testament scholar with a specialty in the book of Genesis. Ted is the pastor at the Boston Mennonite Church and teaches at McCormick Theological Seminary. Also next Sunday for members of Trinity, we will have a very brief congregational meeting following the outdoor worship service for the purpose of electing Jane Gregory as a new deacon. The meeting will be held in person on the south lawn of the church. This weekend, our youth participated in World Vision's 30-hour famine and had a wonderful time. The 30-Hour Famine is an event where students raise funds and awareness to help combat world hunger. This year, all our donations will be going to the beautiful country of Cameroon. Our cash donations will be sent directly to Barfacombe Primary School in Cameroon. This school reached out to Trinity's youth for help with everything from school supplies to a new roof. If you have not yet made a donation and would like to, simply go to www.30hourfamine.org and in the search, search for Trinity Presbyterian Church McKinney and that should take you to our donation page. Our goal this year is $30,000 and we are really excited that we want to get to that $30,000. Last year, the 30 Hour Famine was the last event the youth participated in before everything shut down due to COVID. It felt so good to be back together this weekend again and doing the famine. Today's worship service is the story of Stephen, one of the first deacons and our first martyr. Our youth worked hard to put together a unique online experience for you. So join us as we worship God with Stephen's last act. <laughs> to God. Through the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit, we trust in the one triune God, the Holy One of Israel, whom alone we worship and serve. Join us in the journey of Stephen. At your age, one of the most important things you need to be focused on is school. Suppose that your life completely changed overnight and now you needed to get a job to help pay the bills for your family. You needed to grocery shop and fix your own meals to eat because both of your parents were busy at work. You had to do all the housework and also keep up with your schoolwork. How well do you think your grades in school would be if you had to do all these other things? Most likely your grades would suffer because you wouldn't have the time to study and do the things that you normally do to get good grades. Thankfully, as a child, you can focus on the importance of getting a good education so that one day you can get a job and take care of your own household responsibilities. The apostles. That's what Jesus' helpers were called. Their most important job was to preach and pray. They also knew it was important to feed people. They knew money needed to be taken to the families in need. The apostles needed wisdom to deal with this difficulty in the growing church. They told the believers to choose seven men. These seven men would be leaders in the church and would have to know how to best serve others. The seven men were including Stephen. Some believe these seven men were the very first deacons to serve in the early church. The deacon's job was to serve Jesus by helping people in the church who had needs. If someone was hungry, they made sure the person got food. If someone needed clothes, they made sure they had money to buy clothes. The apostles could then focus on preaching and praying, just like you could focus on school and not paying the bills. Please get your bodies ready to talk to God. Dear God, thank you for giving us men and women who love to serve by feeding, clothing, and visiting the needy. Amen. As a community, 
when we come together to confess our sins. Holy God, maker of us all, have mercy on us. Jesus Christ, servant of the poor, have mercy on us. Holy Spirit, breath of life, have mercy on us. The mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting. I declare unto you, in the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. May the God of mercy, who forgives all of your sins, strengthen you in all your goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. Hey, look, the disciples are meeting. In those days, when the number of disciples was increasing, the Hellenistic Jews among them complained against the Hebraic Jews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. So the twelve gathered all the disciples together. It would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the word of God in order to wait on tables. Brothers and sisters, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the spirit and wisdom. We will turn this responsibility over to them and will give our attention to prayer and the ministry of the word. This proposal pleased the whole group. They chose Stephen, a man full of faith and the Holy Spirit. Also Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, and Nicholas from Antioch, a convert to Judaism. They presented these men to the apostles. They prayed and laid their hands on them. Today, the Sunday after Easter and the Sunday after Jesus rose from the dead, we continue to celebrate his life with our own and learn of his teachings in order to incorporate them into our lives. But before we depart into the aspects of the story, we must learn of how the early Christian church became and the aspects we have learned from and still incorporate into the church today. Early Christianity spread from the Eastern Mediterranean throughout the Roman Empire and beyond. According to the Book of Acts, Jerusalem was the first center for the church where the apostles lived and taught. As the early Christian church began in Jerusalem and the surrounding areas and grew out of Jewish tradition, Jesus and his disciples were all Jews. Christianity was said to have begun after Jesus was resurrected. Forty days after his resurrection, the Holy Spirit descended upon the disciples and other followers of Jesus Christ, becoming a holy day we celebrate as it has become a fundamental part of the life within the church. The day of Pentecost, the spring harvest festival of the Israelites created an occasion for celebration. As everyone wanted to experience such a great festival, every Jew from every nation arrived in Jerusalem and experienced the descent of the Holy Spirit. The resurrection of Jesus Christ combined with the descent of the Holy Spirit sparked revival in the new church and in the hearts of every believer, marking the beginning of the Christian church's new mission to the world. Their mission, as introduced to all peoples to call them to the faith of Jesus Christ, sparked a demand for many new followers, some of them being the Hellenists. As the Hellenists were a Greek-speaking people, primarily living outside of Judea and Galilee, they then settled in Jerusalem, conforming into a new way of life and adapting to their fellow followers of the way of Jesus. There were those who had remained in Judea near Jerusalem who used the Aramaic language. These Aramaic speakers felt strongly that the Hellenist Greek speakers were radically different and that they were not as culturally and structurally Jewish as them. They were both infuriated at the fact that they would not both accept each other's cultures and this created much conflict between the two. As the Hellenists were new to Jerusalem, 
the Aramaic speakers continued to think that the Hellenists should be the only ones absorbing their culture. But as they attempted to adapt, they pursued the thought that the native Aramaic speakers were not treating them as equals. As an example, they thought that the Aramaic speakers were not providing the same amount of food to the most vulnerable members of the Hellenistic Greek-speaking society. All of their differences and contrasting cultures established the long-lasting struggle of the balance between the belief in spreading and learning the word of God and the necessity to accommodate all members of the church, especially the most vulnerable. Stephen and his six companions were selected by the people and affirmed by the twelve disciples to aid the neglected Hellenists and widows spiritually and physically. We can all relate this group of seven disciples to our own board of deacons who take care of the physical and tangible needs of our church body. The board of deacons take a great deal of care to the church body while the elders teach and pray in God's holy name. For example, the deacons watch over the church, assist in service projects or welfare projects, care for the grounds and physical amenities of the church, and serve as needed in any other way to aid the church body. The apostles chose to select seven prominent Hellenistic followers of the way of Jesus in order to delegate the responsibility of care and ministry to the most qualified people being full of the Holy Spirit. As you might know, Devin Voiles has been a deacon through her servant leadership just this last year. She has served among Trinity's spectacular board of deacons who truly take on the responsibility of caring for all of Trinity's members. The work of Stephen and the other disciples is nonetheless a crucial part of our Christian history because of the creation of the deacons and their role among the church body, as well as other beneficial organizations to help God's people, people in need. One of these organizations is the Stephen Ministries organization, which is a creation of Stephen's faithful work. Stephen Ministers is a Christian educational organization who trains others to become a confident caregiver under Stephen's ultimate leadership. Stephen Ministers are trained listeners who provide comfort, hope, and spiritual guidance to those who just need somebody to talk with. The material needs discovered in their conversations are referred to the pastors at the discretion of the Stephen Minister. Throughout the passage, we can see how the whole church body is sort of a team that works together to proclaim God's work. The deacons focus on caring for the church body, the elders teach and pray through God's faithful work, and the members of the church body listen to God's calling and apply it to their own lives. Now Stephen, and then full of God's grace and power, performed great wonders and signs among the people. Opposition arose. However, the members of the synagogue of the freedmen, Jews of Cyrene and Alexandria, as well as the providences of Chalasa and Asia, who began to argue with Stephen, but they could not stand up to they could not stand up against the wisdom the Spirit gave them. As Stephen has been heard speaking blasphemous things about Moses and about God. They stood up the people and the elders of the teachers of the law. They seized Stephen and brought him before the Sanhedrin. This fellow never stops speaking against the holy place and against the law. He says Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and the customs Moses handed down to us. All who were sitting in the Sanhedrin intently looked at Stephen and they saw that his face was like the face of an angel. What do you have to say for yourselves? So bullheaded, calluses on your hearts, flaps on your ears, deliberately ignoring the Holy Spirit. You're just like your ancestors. Was there ever a prophet who didn't get the same treatment? Your ancestors killed anyone who dared talk about the coming of just one. And you've kept up the family tradition. Traitors and murderers, all of you. You have God's law handed to you by angels, gift wrapped, and you scrawled over it. 
At that point, they went wild. A riding mob of cat calls and whistles. I oh, heard And infected. But Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, hardly noticed. He only had eyes for God, whom he saw in all his glory with Jesus standing at his side. Oh, I see heaven wide open, and the Son of Man standing at God's side. Yelling and hissing, the mob drowned him out. Now in full stampede, they dragged him out of town and pelled him with rocks. The ringleaders took off their coats and asked the young man named Saul to watch them. Master Jesus, take my life. Master, don't blame them for this sin. Stephen was a deacon and charismatic leader who worked great wonders and signs among the people. In our passage, opponents of the gospel attempted to debate with him, but they could not withstand the wisdom and the spirit with which he spoke. Stephen was bold, a fearless proponent of the good news of Jesus' resurrection. Because they couldn't beat him on the merits of his argument, Stephen's adversaries turned to a more barbarous plan. They went to the religious leaders and accused Stephen of publicly blaspheming both God and Moses one of the 18 crimes punishable by death in the Bible. After bringing in fake witnesses to testify against him, Stephen was arrested and brought before the Sanhedrin. The Sanhedrin were assemblies of elders and chief priests who were appointed to sit as a tribunal in every city in the ancient land of Israel. Essentially, in modern terms, the Sanhedrin could be the biblical equivalent of the American Congress, or in our church, the Session. When the members of the Sanhedrin heard what Stephen was saying, they became infuriated. As was customary, Stephen was given the opportunity to defend himself and went on to deliver a remarkably courageous speech where he carefully summarized Israelite history up to and including the building of the first temple in Jerusalem. He connected the ancient rituals of the Mosaic law to the new order of things brought by Jesus. In short, Stephen alluded to a new way of worshiping God made possible by Jesus' death and resurrection. This new way was a direct challenge of the authority of the religious leadership he was testifying to. Incredibly, Stephen did not back down on delivering the unvarnished truth, even though he knew his life was on the line. He was staunchly direct. What was supposed to be his defense turned more into an indictment. He said, you stiff-necked people, you are just like your ancestors. Which of the prophets did your ancestors not persecute? They put to death those who foretold the coming of the righteous one whose betrayers and murderers you have now become. Look, he said, I see heaven open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. At this, they covered their ears, yelling at the top of their voices. They all rushed to him, dragged him out of the city, and began to stone him. Meanwhile, the witnesses laid their coats at the feet of a young man named Saul. While they were stoning him, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he fell on his knees and cried out, Lord, do not hold this sin against him. After saying this, he died. Stephen was the first person murdered because of his belief in Jesus Christ, what we refer to as a martyr. Being stoned was a slow and cruel death, but Stephen endured it through his bold faith. He even asked God to have mercy on these merciless men, just as Jesus did. going to lie, Stephen makes me feel like my faith is astronomically weak. Stephen courageously advocated against delinquency and poetically died in a manner reflective of Christ. Stephen, being the first Christian martyr, created a challenging precedent. Are we, as followers of Christ, supposed to aim in, to live in such a Christ-like manner that we're supposed to die for him as well? Rather, I think, the more pragmatic takeaway from the life of Stephen is his mere refusal to stand idly by to injustice. Typically, the idea of battling injustices through faith is romanticized into a vision of something as simple as saying a prayer, and through some divine intervention, evil is smited. However, one of the most interesting aspects of Stephen's story was the way it highlighted the messiness of it. In fact, Stephen's refusal to be a bystander to these injustices 
led to his own tragic ending. Stephen reminds us that to live in a Christ-like manner is a painful and laborious task. Being a Christian isn't supposed to be easy. It never will be and never has proven by Stephen. As I began preparing for my message to all of y'all, I reflected on my own life. Could I genuinely call myself a Christian if I did not challenge myself daily to live as radically as Christ or Stephen even? By a mere stroke of luck, my experience under oppression has been minimal. However, my larger role as a bystander to the oppression of others has been sickening. This became evident to me whenever I traveled to Brownsville with the youth leadership team in the summer of 2019. It was one of those blistering August days where your shirt sticks to your skin and the sun beats down on you so hard you can barely open your eyes. As a youth leadership team, we prepared a fresh meal for the 500 asylum seekers across the border in conjunction with Team Brownsville. Confident in Cold Curry's fluency in Spanish, after just one year of studying, we strode across the border with a fleet of wagons holding pasta salad. As we made our way, I peered through the chain link fence and watched a group of kids, no older than I, wading through the murky Rio Grande as a way of escaping the ruthless heat, if only for a second, surrounded by troops of dragonflies and water bugs harboring in the cattails that sit proudly on the riverbank. We officially crossed the border and just a walk across the street later, we arrived at the plaza. The plaza looked like a small village with an array of tents and the humdrum of life oozing from the sidewalk. Feeding 500 people was overwhelming. But as we began serving food, the asylum seekers had an organized system where women and children got fed first. After everyone was fed, we spent time playing with the kids and learning about how people, people's lives and how they got there. I turned and found myself staring at a rocking horse. It was in the middle of the plaza as the summer breeze gently cradled it back and forth. It looked exactly like the rocking horse I had in my own room when I was a little girl. And that's when it hit me. There was no difference between me and the little girl who shared my rocking horse, except for the fact that she had to flee violence and survive off the mercy of others, while I got to be the three-year-old who worried about what outfit my American Girl doll was going to wear next. I have been living a life with no fear of violence, while a little girl who shared the same rocking horse as I slept in a tent a hundred yards away from the border, desperate to simply stay alive. How could I justify my role as a bystander to the oppression of this little girl? When I visited, there were 500 people. Exactly one year later, there were 2,000 people. As a youth leadership team, we came back and educated our friends about the asylum seekers, and we sent our cash donations from last year's famine to Team Brownsville. But there is so much more to do. Admittedly, in this relentless fight against injustice within our own systems, we can get lost in the murkiness of the interconnectedness of politics and morals. But at the end of the day, the best way we can display our love for Jesus is to advocate for the livelihoods of our brothers and sisters in Christ, no matter how large the feast. So dear friends, today I ask you, what are you doing today to live in the image of Jesus Christ? Let us pray for all those in need, saying we wait for you, Lord, and in your word we hope. Holy God, you watch over our going out and our coming in, and your spirit upholds us in every circumstance. Your Son, Jesus Christ, is our Alpha and our Omega, and our hope and trust is in him. In our despair, we turn to you. We wait for you, Lord, and in your word we hope. Lord, in our waiting, we pray for our nation as we battle the coronavirus. We pray for the children of Cameroon as they return to school after a long absence. We pray for those in our congregation that are hurting and are in need, and we pray for all those who are hungry and scared. We wait for you, Lord, and in your word we hope. Please join me as we pray the prayer Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, as we forgive our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
please join me in the offertory prayer. All that we are in our creation, as in our salvation, is a gift from the triune God. With gratitude and thanksgiving, we offer ourselves for service. We offer our prayers for the life of the world, and we offer our gifts for the mission and ministry of Christ. Amen. May you believe in God, but may you come to see that God believes in you. May you have faith in Jesus, but may you come to see that Jesus has faith that you can be like him. A person of love and compassion and truth. A person of forgiveness and peace and grace and joy and hope. And may you be covered in the dust of your rabbi, Jesus.